This is Get Real with Deb Waterbury, a show where Dr. Deb gets real as she teaches through books and studies on topics relevant for today. And now, here is your host, Dr. Deb Waterbury. Welcome to our last message in our series on Threads, book three of the Painted Window Trilogy. That's book two, sorry. Book two of the Painted Window Trilogy. I'm already going on to book three. Now, book two of the Painted Window Trilogy is Threads. We're on the very last chapter, part eight, which is called Remind Them. We, um, we are go- we've gone through the first book, Painted Window. We're finishing the second book. We will start the next book, painted, which is called White Zephyr. It is the third book in the trilogy. And, and White Zephyr will be the culmination of this. So we know we've moved through, and you can get all these books at debwaterbury.com. You know, we've moved through this journey of Elizabeth and her friends who are indicative of we as believers as the, in the accepting of Jesus as our bridegroom who loves us and has saved us. And then the second book about what do we do with when he's not here? How do we go up against trials, tribulations, assaults from the enemy to try to remember his words? And then book three is that once we kind of get to that, how do we fulfill our mission on this earth waiting on Jesus to return? So allegorically, the characters set in this medieval town uh, village called Comdenshire are doing the same sorts of things, but from an allegorical standpoint. So what we have here in part eight, as we end threads, is that Elizabeth and her friends, there are 12 of them, and they have gone through lots of stuff through this book, and um, and they've, because they've forgotten, you know, Reginald gets called away. King Reginald gets called away at the very beginning of the book, much as Jesus says was, was ascended and is not here. And because he wasn't there physically with them, it was difficult for them to hang on to his words, hang on to his encouragement, hang on to his rules, hang on to his love even. And so the book really does have them falling and rising, a lot of falling, before they finally start to remember what King Reginald said to them. And again, he left them, as you as you saw before, little notes that were his word, um, which is reminiscent of the Bible. And so by the end, as you get to the end of part eight, you'll see they've all come together um, in this home uh, and, and they're at this place now and they're outside and the people of Comdenshire have gone out of their minds. There's rioting happening, people are you know yelling, fighting, whatever, because they have fallen into a state of sin because they've lost sight of the fact that the king will return. These 12 recognize because the king gave them this assignment that it is theirs to remind the people that the king's coming back. And so at the end of book two, they're trying to figure out how they're going to do that. And then we move into book three from there, remembering that all the while we have all the forces of darkness, mostly exemplified in that one character named Humphrey, but he has lots of other people working with him that keep assailing and assaulting the people. And right now he seems to be being pretty triumphant in that. He's very successful. They're kind of going nuts and they're all falling into sin. So what do these 12 that King Reginald has have commissioned to remind the people, how do they do that? That will be book three. So right now it is about this final section and I did call this remind them. And, and I thought it was it would be important for us to go back and talk about what it looks like to translate into real trust that God is our first source of comfort and that Jesus is coming back. So we talked last week about remembering that we have a purpose, that we have to go to God first. And so I want to end with why is that important? Why is it important that we go back to his word? Why is that the undergirding that we need so that we can do what we are set here on this earth to do, fulfill our purpose in kingdom building? And I, you know, I always, whenever I'm at a place where I'm trying to figure out how to do something when I'm in the middle of bad stuff or whatever, I love going back to David. David was, as we know, a man after God's own heart, but, but being called a man after God's own heart means that he was literally going after God all the time. David's one purpose, his whole, whole focus was what does God say? What would God have me do? He always turned back to God. That made him a man after God's own heart. That didn't mean he didn't sin, didn't mean he didn't mess up, didn't mean he wasn't prideful sometimes. I mean, the man committed murder, adultery, pride, all kinds of stuff. He did all kinds of things wrong. It wasn't that he was perfect, but that he always went back to his father. So I thought it would be really important for us to end this book as we all go out into the world today and tomorrow and the next day save it if Jesus comes back, which we really pray that he does. But if he doesn't, then we go about into the world these days and we've got to figure out how to do it. 
right? What do, how, do, how can we do that? And where, how do we know how to go to God when it doesn't look so good? David really gives us a great picture of that in many of the Psalms, but one of the ones I think he does the best in is Psalm 25. So Psalm 25, uh, again, was written by David. You can go ahead and read there, go there if you want to. Um, we're going to be reading that in its entirety here in a moment. But um, I wanted to look there because there are three things about David that we can see in Psalm 25 that I think are easy for us to apply to our own lives in this world while we try to figure out how we go about our purpose in kingdom building. What was his situation? How does he look for guidance? And how does he make sure he's hearing from God? I think those three sections, if we can apply what David learned about those three things, we can apply them easily to just about any situation in our lives. So let's start by reading Psalm 25. And then I wanna go back and look at those three questions and talk about how David can teach us how to move through situations by looking at God's word in an appropriate way and who God is. So Psalm 25, let's read that together first. And then, and I'm going to read it in its entirety. It's not terribly long, but it'll take me a minute. So it's my little subtitle says, teach me your paths of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O God. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me, and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh Lord, out of all of his troubles. So when we look at this then, the first thing we see about what David is doing is, is his situation. I kind of want to talk about that first question. What is David's situation? And he's really struggling with four things here. David's struggling with fear. He's struggling with loneliness. He's struggling with guilt. And he's struggling with confusion. And I think you and I can probably say that we all kind of struggle with those at one time or other. <laughs> he's got loneliness, guilt, fear, and confusion. So let's look at each of these and then talk about how he deals with that. The first one we know that David is dealing with fear. He talks about that in verses 2 and 19. Verse 2, do not let me put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. He's got people coming against him. Verse 19, see how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. His, his, David's fear is about his reputation being in danger and about them hurting him, but he is feeling fear. Now, the second thing David is feeling is lonely. And you know, often when we feel like we're being attacked, we will always feel, mostly always feel like we're alone in that. And so David's feeling that. The second thing is loneliness. He's struggling with that. People are, you know, and, and I know that we often feel that way, especially, like I said, when we're being attacked or even in our Christianity. You know, you're, if, once, if you're a new believer, your old friends, you know, might not want to have anything to do with you anymore. You start feeling lonely in that transition. Well, David felt that too, and he expressed it in verse 16. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. David's also feeling guilt, and you and I do that all the time. He's struggling with guilt because of his sins, and he says that four times in this, in this, um, in this psalm. Verse 7, remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. Verse 8, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. Verse 11, for the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. And verse 18, look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. 
it's really hard to forget our sin. I mean, it's really difficult to go through life and forget. And you know, sometimes it's good to remember where we came from, but we can move that into condemnation and guilt at times too. And so David's dealing with that. And he's dealing with feeling confused. And, this, and you and I, especially, we have a difficult decision in front of us and we're being persecuted or we feel like we're alone or whatever. We can start being confused about, what am I supposed to do here, God? What, do you, what does he want me to do? What, should I do this? Should I do that? Are you even listening? Well, David felt that way too. Verses four through five, he says, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me for your God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. David's just pleading with the Lord, tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. I need you to, I mean, I, I, how many times <laughs> have I heard and had clients come in to talk to me or women come talk to me, they're like, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I feel like I can't hear him. I don't, he's not telling me what to do. David was pleading in the same, he's confused. I'm in this place, I'm, I, I don't know what to do. Which brings out the next question, what does David do for guidance? How does he find guidance in this? And the answer to that is pretty simple. And that's what we've been talking about for a while, he prays. There are 18 different supplications in this poem. I mean, the Psalm, 18 times he pull, puts together a request before the Lord. He's praying. He, the answer to any time, any of this is how do we, how, what do we do to get guidance? We pray about that. And you know, we, we look for answers uh, from God. We want his guidance. And sometimes we think we're gonna, so many people, and I know I have to, you're just like, I just wish I could hear his voice. If you just hear him tell me what to do, I'd feel so much better. Well, first off, you'd be dead. Um, let me just tell you that right now. But we, we think we've got to have something concrete or a vision maybe or a dream or something. Lord, give me some way to hear you. And, and the Bible does describe, you know, lots of ordinary ways of dispensing the guidance of, for him, the, the, those ble the dreams, visions, you know, even audio, audible voice. But let me hear, tell you one thing. You want guidance from God, the most ordinary way and the most common way we get God's guidance is to develop something called spiritual sensitivity. Now that is not, that's not about visions. That's not about dreams. That's not about audible voices. That's not about a prophetic words. That's about being so sensitive to God that you get guidance from him because you know him. That spiritual sensitivity, that's the, you know, that's when you pray and you know in your, I call it my gut, your gut knows because your gut knows because you are spiritually sensitive to who God is. So therefore you're spiritually sensitive to what God would direct. If you don't know him, if you don't know him well enough, then you're not going to be sensitive to who he is. The most common and the most widely used way that the Lord will guide you is through spiritual sensitivity. And you, brother and sister, are the only one who can develop that. Nobody, that doesn't come magically with a vision. It might even come with a vision if you're not spiritually sensitive, you won't even know what that vision means. <laughs> you can have a dream and think it's about something entirely different because you're not spiritually sensitive. But nobody can give you spiritual sensitivity. Only you can develop that. And you develop spiritual sensitivity by diving into who God is, by knowing who He is. What does He expect? How does He work? What does He do? How does He show you things? You know God. And if you know God, then when situations come and you ask Him for guidance, your sensitivity to who he is will show you where to go because you would know what God says. I love this quote by John Piper. He talks about this and he said, guidance is the product not of ecstatic heights, but of spiritual truth. Normally, God guides his children through spiritual sensitivity to the present implications of God's character and purposes that are revealed in his word. Just a pretty way of saying what I just did. You go to God's word, you get to know God, and then you become sensitive to who he is, and then guidance comes from it, from this. It means you have to bring your heart and your mind into harmony with God's heart and his mind. And you cannot do that through magic. <laughs> you can't do that through pixie dust being sprinkled on your head or some vision. You have to get into his word and get to know him so that you are now in harmony with him. And how do we do that? It's so easy. Proverbs 2, 1 through 5 tells you exactly how to do it. 
My son, if you accept my words and if you store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and if you cry aloud for understanding and if you look for it as if for silver and if you search for it as if for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You got to get in here. (laughs) You got to look for God like you're looking for hidden treasure. You strive for it. You look for it. You search for it. You meditate on it. You long for it. And you only find that in God's word. You find that in his words. And then that brings to the final question that we asked about David was how did he, when he heard or had that spiritual sensitivity, how did he know it was God? And how many times have I heard it as people ask me that? How do I know if I'm hearing from him? How do I know that's God? That might be me. It could be Satan. How do I know if it's God? Well, verses 8 through 10 kind of tell you that in Psalm 25. Good five, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his verses. David describes here in these verses the kind of person who can be confident that they're hearing from God. And this is the kind of person. That person will admit that he or she is a sinner. They will be humble before the throne of grace in that imperfect state that they are, and they will keep God's commands. You cannot hear from God. Hear me, hear me, hear me. You cannot hear from God or will have a difficult time doing so if you are in rebellious sin. I cannot tell you, even in my own life too, but so many people in the midst of rebellious sin, I'm doing this thing, I know I shouldn't be doing this thing, but I want to do this thing, and now they're wanting to know why they can't hear God. I'm going to tell you, you cannot hear the voice of your father when you are rebelling against him. Those who know they're getting God's guidance are keeping his commands and are moving as much as they can in the purity of who he says we should be. When you know something is wrong and you can, rebellious sin is not one time or you know, you may do it and then you repent. Rebellious sin is continuous. It means I'm in this, it's, it's having an affair. It's drinking every night. It's, you know, lying all the time, gossiping every time you get a chance. You are, you literally know it's not right. Right? and you haven't just done it once or twice, you are engaging in rebellious sin. It becomes a lifestyle for you that you refuse to get past or refuse to get rid of. When you are in a pattern of rebellious sin, you will not be able to understand God. You cannot get a guidance from one that you are blocking out from your rebellious sin, which is why David very clearly says, one of the things we must be is obedient obedient to what God commands so that we then are in harmony with him. How can you expect to be in harmony with the God of all creation if you're rebelling against him? There's no harmony in rebellion. So you have to be literally aligned with him and what he teaches in order to be in harmony with his heart, mind, and his heart and mind so that you'll know what it is he would guide you to do. And you know, I go back to what I talked about last week for just a second. When you, you have to go here first to God's word, counsel from others, be it a counselor, a minister, a pastor, a friend, whoever, it has to be subsequent. It has to be just to confirm what God himself says. So let me help you with just a couple of things, three things to take counsel from Psalm 25. The first thing is as you walk with him, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> don't, don't, this is no rose colored glasses. As you walk with Jesus, there's going to be trouble and you will struggle with fear and loneliness and guilt and confusion. You just will. But number two, when you do, you need to come to him, to God in prayer and bring all your struggles with no hesitation. And then number three, the basis of your expectation when you come is not that the messages are promised in visions, but that guidance is promised in humility and in the fear of the Lord, which is your own goal of holiness. These, this is the counsel we get when we're, when we're in a situation we need guidance from God. That's Go to Psalm 25. Go to these things the way David did it. And this is the counsel we get from that. So as we come to the end of Threads, and we're going to move into White Zephyr next, 
we see that there is trouble for the characters and there it's it's trouble for us just as it's trouble for them elizabeth and her friends are going to find that they have even more trouble ahead of them but they fixed their eyes on the truth they have brought themselves finally into harmony with king reginald and in that harmony they fix their eyes on the truth it doesn't mean the trouble stops as a matter of fact in white zephyr you're going to see it is coming to a crescendo and they have got some stuff happening to them in that book but even so, their eyes are fixed. This is my job. I have purpose. My king will return. What do I do? May God's word, the place that you go in this day, in this present season, in this place where we live, Jesus is coming. You know that. When you get to the point of, of, of understanding and you're really moving and you're rooting in God's words, fix your eyes on that prize. What is it that you're to do as we look forward to his coming again? You do not sit. Why did Jesus tell the parable of the people, the, the men that got the talents and one of them, you know, invested, another one of them, they invested and, and doubled it to 10 five, whatever. And then that one dude buried it and only had one. Why was he, why, you know, you read that and sometimes people are like, well, why is that so bad? At least he had the one. He didn't lose it. Well, he didn't do anything with it. It would be like you and I thinking, yep, Jesus is coming again. I'm his. I'm going to sit over here in a corner and just hide and wait until he comes. That's not your purpose. As I told you two or three weeks ago, your purpose on this earth is not your own happiness. Your purpose on this earth is not to have a nice house and a nice car to live in comfort and make sure you have good friends and you can play golf whenever you want to. That's not your purpose. It's, you know, I know Piper wrote this book one time. It's called Don't Waste Your Life. In the very beginning of it, he, he described this couple who dies and all they do their entire life, they retire and they go out and they settle by the sea and they just collect shells. They're just going to live in peace for the rest of their life. And so they just live by the sea, play golf every once in a while, belong to the country club, go out with their friends and collect seashells. And then they go to heaven and she stand before God. And God's like, what do you have to show? What did you do? What did you do to kingdom build? And they hold out these shells. Well, we have these. That's a waste. That's a waste of what your purpose is. So as you're moving through, you get to the place where you're going to God's word, Look, keep your eyes on the prize. God, what do I do to kingdom build? Continually going into his word, looking for your purpose, moving in the kingdom, moving to bring others to him. And you do that. And you don't have to be able to stomp out in the middle of the city, preaching the word. Some people like think that's the only way you evangelize. Brothers and sisters, we evangelize by our love. Jesus very seldom went around screaming. Matter of fact, he didn't tell anybody he was the Messiah until he told that woman at the well. She was the first one he ever told that to. So it wasn't like he was screaming about that all the time. Jesus loved people into the kingdom. He served people into the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, that's how we evangelize. Of course we share the gospel. I'm not saying you don't do that, but you got to get to that place. And you get to that place by loving them and serving them into the kingdom. So find those places. God bless you. I hope you'll join me for that next book, the third book called White Zephyr. Again, you can get all these books either individually or together at my website, debwaterbury.com. See you next time. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Get Real with Deb Waterbury. I hope you were blessed and I hope you got some information that's going to help you get through your day. If you want any more information on any of my books or my articles or on any of my future speaking engagements, you can find all that information at debwaterbury.com. God bless you.